All right, Monica, there's the question. Tell me about okay. the 10th Amendment and how it's relevant today. Well, I always, 10th Amendment is my favorite amendment, although I love all of the amendments in the Bill of Rights. But you every refer to one it of a them. lot. You refer yes, I do. Lot. I do. And I always thought if I was going to not do podcasts, I might go work for the 10th Amendment Center because they're about restoring it. I always have my constitution next to me. I have several copies. This is not my super marked up one, but you've seen that one. So yep. I'll just read the amendment real quick. The powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution nor prohibited by it to the states are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. There's 18 enumerated powers in the constitution, yada, yada. Basically anything that's not in the constitution is the purview of the states included in that through adjudication. It's been clear Supreme court that the police powers, it's called the police powers, but includes everything from education to welfare, to policing, to health, everything that regulates that kind of stuff or pertains to that kind of stuff is squarely, unequivocally in the realm of the states. We now, when you hear them saying, Bill Barr, whoever say, the rioters are from other states, as if like the ones in Boston go to Connecticut, the one in Connecticut go to New York, the one in New York go to New Jersey. What does that do? It gives the feds a right to go in there and interfere. Same thing with gun control. If you can say it's a cross-border thing, they're going to say they have the right to do it. And I think that's why they're doing it. I think they want a federal police force. They want to get past all this. But for me, the Tenth Amendment would solve everyone's problems for everything if they would just restore it. When I was saying that with Obama, just restore the Tenth Amendment and you can have Obama do whatever you want. Then the same people who loved Obama hate Trump. And my answer to them was just restore the Tenth Amendment. The, California doesn't have to secede because they hate Trump and they don't have to look to the UN for an international police force, which is what I'm afraid of. Okay. Is that good. they will just, they all they need to do is restore the Tenth Amendment. There are countries smaller than California California and New York, as far as population goes, if they want to have a complete welfare state, they could have it. They could have complete transfer of wealth. They are beyond any kind of critical mass that is right now at work in socialist countries. So why do they have to have the whole entire multi-regional uh, 50 state complex? It's just a matter of control and globalization. Okay. Now that you've said that, I got it. This, this, this is why I love doing live because it leads to my next question. <sighs> There she is drinking unsweet tea. Every Sorry. Southerner. I'm a Yankee. I know. I think okay. it's like little kids drink sweet stuff. I drink sweet. No, you're from the South. You always, it's funny when you go places, you go, hey, I get some sweet tea. And then you go up north and they go, "There's you just want tea. Oh, oh no. go ahead. Oh, you don't know how bad it is. When I first moved to Atlanta, I would ask for tea and they would give me iced tea. <laughs> I was like, I want tea. Tea, tea, regular tea type tea. Like, oh, hot tea. I'm like, yeah. But nobody in Atlanta went, I can't. Nobody did that. They went, are you sure, y'all? That's what they asked. That's Maybe they something like that. She was a okay. real sweet waitress. I loved her at the All right. Cafe. Well, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to take what you said about the uh, Tenth Amendment, and I'm gonna we're going to skip some questions I had. I want to go to one of the questions that we were going to cover today. But before we do that, tell everybody how to find you. Okay. Thank you. Please. I, I have a daily podcast with my co-host, Binkley. It's called The Drive Time News Blast, but it's part of our overall body of work, The Propaganda Report, which you can find under Propaganda Report on your favorite podcasting feed. Subscribe to us there. Actually, subscribe to us on all of your favorite podcasting feeds so that we go up in the search engines. I also have a URL, the website, thepropreport.com, where you can find all of our shows. They're really, really great. And if you're a patron, Patreon dot com slash propaganda report you get 15 extra minutes of news of the day from a perspective of truth liberty and justice plus you can get parties and we do lots of fun stuff you went to our party i was at your party last night my question is what's the discord after party what is that there's another party oh, after oh, the party yeah well some listeners of the show who probably stay up later than I am and are way, way younger, go to Discord, which is a new platform, not, it's probably not a new platform, but it's an, a different platform. It's kind of like if you could go off into a room on Twitter and just talk to each other. I even think you can plug in a mic and cameras. You can, I've done it where you are in a room like a Zoom thing and you talk to each other oh, like wow. with audio and video. So they set it up 
And then people who love the propaganda report, kind of like-minded people, we have thousands and thousands of daily listeners, so they can go there and just chat with each other. I don't, I didn't go to the after party because I had, my call pass was expired. <laughs> uh, I, I, I was on the party last night and it was, it was, yeah. it's as close to a real party as yes. you can get. That's the goal. Virtual. It's as close to, and you don't mm. actually have to socialize and mingle if you don't want to. You could be a fly on the wall or you can participate. I think it's unique and super awesome. I really look forward to it. I, I commented a few times, but watching, it's almost like people watching, except you just get to watch comments. And then you, you, get to, you get to assume what people look like, which is I great because I, I started making people. Well, some of them have great avatars. So you can, you can make yourself be and look like anybody you want. Yeah. Okay. Here's my question. Are you ready mm -hmm. for this? Based off your, hey, what's up, Daryl? Hey, Daryl. John Jasper and John Ballinger. I'm glad you're here, John. We're gonna. I can't wait to get some input from Is you. Is John Jasper here? Yep. Hey, Franny. John Jasper go. lives in London. He's from Atlanta. Oh, that's awesome. All right, here we go. So my question, I was going to get to eventually, but <clears throat> and I've asked this a couple of times, and I know we've addressed it, but every week I want to. I'm, I'm going to ask it different ways. So based on what you said in the 10th Amendment, and this can go to other things, but how do people how do people cross the line between how we were founded, the goal of what was written when we were founded, and this crazy world we're living in now where it seems like it's all twisted and meddled together. We have bits and pieces that seem right, bits and pieces that seem wrong, and our options to vote seem everybody's got some stuff that's right, some stuff that's wrong. How are we supposed to navigate this and change things and live? When I feel like we're railing against the machine, but we also have to be, we have to participate somehow or we can never change it. So okay. how do so, you do that? I'll tell you. I, first of all, I'm a fan of the Articles of Confederation. I do not think that they, that the replacement of that with the Constitution was legal. However, I like the Constitution too. It's a little overbroad and it's certainly opened well, the door. we're glad you like it. Yes. yes, it opened the door for all this, though. So in the immortal words of Lysander Spooner, the Constitution either meant to lead us here or it just was flawed enough that here we are. But either way, it didn't work. So that's one way of looking at it. I'm actually a defender of the Constitution, even though I'm an anarcho-capitalist, because I do believe that if that is a compromise that we could actually stick to between having a monopoly on the use of force, it would be okay. Like I'm okay standing by that, but more, more important, I feel like if we are going to live in a monopoly of force environment, i.e. a government like this, the state, a government can, doesn't necessarily have to have force, but, uh, my home is governed and we don't use force. So, but the, See, my, but home the is, my home is, indoor, is, is you do use force. Yeah, That's all right. It's your prerogative, yeah. I think, within reason. Yeah. So, but I do defend the Bill of Rights because, and I've said this before, libertarians die by the sword, but they don't always want to live by the sword. I defend the Bill of Rights because if we have to die by the sword, the Constitution, we'd better have at least the limitations that keep this tolerable, keep it going. Now, maybe people want accelerationism. They want a complete revolution. I don't. I think that the whole of history is basically kicking the can of tyranny down the road. And and the Bill of Rights is perfect, I think. And I think that it would forestall all the problems we're having, the surveillance state, terrorism, everything is anticipated by those fundamental laws. And the vote does not get to change any of that. The vote shouldn't really make much of a difference. As a matter of fact, you basically only have a vote, in my opinion, so that the people who craft the laws within that narrow framework and then execute the laws, maybe adjudicate, that you actually pick those people so that they they aren't infiltrators. They they're supposed to. They I obviously they don't represent us, but they're supposed to, and that's why we're supposed to vote. But you, you're not <sighs> voting on what what the rights are, what the fundamental law. You're not voting. We have fundamental law. That's the Constitution. You're well, just voting on who's going to carry it out. And technically speaking, they're not giving you rights. The government that, that's set in place <laughs> to keep that's set in place to protect you from your rights being taken away. <laughs> who gave you? Yes, right. Who? They, I mean, why do you have rights? Because God gave me rights. Okay, That's so exactly. what about Gitmo? I, I get, I understand where you're going. I understand. Where am I going? Well, but what? Okay, wait. Let me say. Let me go back. Tell me, what about Gitmo? 
I had a show in Atlanta where most people were conservatives and they would say, the government doesn't give you rights. You have your rights. That just enshrines your rights. So I would say, okay, why do the people in Gitmo not get a jury? Why do we get to just hold them captive? Are they, because they're not Americans, people would say. But, but that, okay, and but I would say, it's is it the American government that gives you your rights or are they universal? Because uh, the neoconservative, the new conservative looks at other people and does not recognize that they have those rights. They look at the rights as being exclusively American. I, okay. So I was speaking out of this uh, a big picture, like the purity thing. They can't take up rights away. If we're going to dive down and to see where we live and what really happens, then of course the government acts like they can give and take away rights. That you can don't even have to go to Gitmo. You can get you can get pulled over for things you shouldn't get pulled over for on a daily basis. There's there's you know people you know police officers or people can to can violate their authority. They can go above and beyond all the time. That doesn't mean that the philosophy behind what's in place is still not there. It's still supposed to be the government cannot uh, give you rights. It's there to protect your rights. And I think that's why we see sometimes when we see people getting frustrated and mad is because it does seem like the government has overstepped their bounds by a long shot. Yes. By and I was. Shot. Yeah, I was very careful. Somebody said, so what would, would libertarians say to how to deal with these riots that are happening? And I was very careful to word it in a way, I, I used to kind of dismiss the importance of the language in this case. Uh, a favorite sweep of mine, Nacho Slave, said, you've got to watch out how you talk. Yep. You're, you're misrepresenting where the rights come from, for example. So what I was very careful to say is there's three things that I think government needs to do and it will stop all these problems. The first thing is they need to stop infringing on our right to bear arms and our not only our gun rights, but our drug rights. We have the right to smoke what God put in the ground for us. We can do that. We're allowed to do it. We ha we can we have gun rights. We have drug rights. If we have gun rights, we definitely have drug rights. So, so on the drug, where do you stop? Is there a drug you stop yeah. at? Do you stop at cocaine, LSD, nothing? Do for me to tell other people what they can do? Yeah, I'm just talking about when it comes to laws. Do you just yeah, say? Okay. I would never tell uh, somebody else what they could do with their their body. I mean, that's yeah. that. When you get into abortion, I'm very anti-abortion, but you have to think about who's going to use force against whom in order to enforce those laws. Would I walk up to somebody and put a gun to their head and said, "Stop snorting coke or chewing coca leaves"? I was in Peru. They make tea out of coke. It's the best. It's coca. It's the leaves are not tea leaves. They're coca leaves. The caffeine, cocaine, it's just where the stuff comes from. Right. So, uh, and I'm, it's just, it's none of my business what you want to do with your body, right? They all say, oh, there are too many people in the world. All right, well, let them kill themselves or make better themselves. Drugs are good. So that's the first thing. Okay. The second thing is I would say- That's a say whole they, podcast, by the way. Yes, yeah, yes. I yes. do podcasts every day. The second I never thing, stop. I'm sorry. I never the stop. second thing, my bad. Is that they, there is a- they need to stop infringing on our private property rights. A lot of what happens is they started with segregation. They told you you must segregate. Then they told you you must not segregate. Then they told you that you had to not have exclusive communities. And then what happens is I, I'm not, I like the, what they call the melting pot. Maybe it's a controversial term. I like it. I'm melted. This is a melt. And I've always loved it. I'm from New York. I thrive on it. I love it. My culture is everything. I think most people are melted. They just don't know it. Yeah, I'm super yeah. melty. Yeah. And my kids are even more. So, but here's the thing. When you say you cannot control your associations, your property, your business, you cannot decide arbitrarily if you want or unfairly if you want who comes on and who comes off, then 350 million people have to get together and decide what happens at the border of the country. Why not just decide what happens on the border of your property? And then you don't, the people in Texas don't have to have an immigration problem because they have the castle doctrine. Someone crosses the border from Mexico to your property in Texas or from your neighbor's house to your property in Texas, you, you can shoot them for stepping over the line. I'm not advocating that. That seems a little harsh to me. I'm, you do have the right. But there are cities in, on the border of Texas, I, I, and maybe I'm wrong. You can correct me because you're the research girl, but that ha may have higher crime rates if the border is not protected as well. You need all... Crime is individual. Okay. It's just individual. So look, if they want, if the states want to have their own 
approach to how to deal with the borders than they can. And those borders are going to, those border states are going to have a lot cheaper land because it comes in a big responsibility to have to defend the border against a different onslaught. Right. And that's how it would be. Those border states would be real cheap. You'd have buffer land. That would be your frontier. You want to be a scrappy guy. You go out and get yourself some of that land, put yourself a cow and get yourself a gun. So I'm just saying property rights Violating property rights leads to this need for collectivism, needs to collective justice, whereas you could just make those decisions. And then the last thing is that in service of the drug war, which I think is a jobs program, but if somebody's doing their coke, smoking some crack, killing themselves with crack in the corner, and you go up to him and you take his crack, you're stealing from him. You apprehend him and take him in, you're kidnapping him and you put him in jail, that's a killing. And sometimes you kill him trying to get him in jail because he doesn't want to go to jail because it's none of your effing business what he's doing. So the government is kidnapping, stealing and killing in the name of telling you what's good for you. Okay. And I will tell you this about the drug thing. Mm -hmm. It's a really weird thing that people who are for gun rights are not for drug rights because what's the argument for why we have drug drug laws why we have prohibitions what is the argument protect us from the, protect yeah, whom us our kids Who's us a society okay so what is the argument against gun rights what are gun control after okay I, yeah, yeah. The, the rhetorical question is well taken ma'am it is well taken i've got to, i'm gonna put a but i got to clarify something earlier because i said and i'm gonna put john's uh, quote up here he's a buddy of mine and this guy's one of the smartest guys i know when it comes to businesses and, and insurance and stuff but uh when i said my house is you know you, you were saying use violence yeah i live by myself so when i said use violence i was referring to people oh yes I coming knew. into my house yeah, yeah. yeah i, I live by myself and my dog my dog is too cool to, to be violent too. he's a cool dog uh this is the, the comment from john it says uh <clears throat> I concur with the ideas, Monica, but with the lack of critical thinking and personal responsibility, there must be a balance of law and order and allowing those to live free and die hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, law, law and order is how you live free and die hard. And I would say <clears throat> that you don't need a monopoly on the use of force or laws that infringe on other people's mm -hmm. rights to do that. You want to live free, then you have to defend yourself. And if you want to band together with your neighbors to make a gated community and defend that, that's fine. And but you see, can call that a government if you want. But we can. But also, if we go back to this almost clannish tribalism groups, it's neighborhood. But we, we eventually, isn't that how you break a country? In my opinion, you can. Isn't that how a country breaks apart instead of come together? Is because, what? Is well, is the I'm just here's my group. This is my. But why? I'm you know, my, here's the thing. Th this is why I don't. I don't buy that. This country, strictly well, I was just speaking, asking. I wasn't trying to sell something. I was just asking. No, 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 yeah. no. But I, this country, you have to take it country by country. So this country, to the extent that you have freedom of movement, so mm -hmm. like a third of all the immigrants back in the day went back. My grandparents, one in four of my grandparents went back. One died, one went back, and two stayed. So they came over or maybe my great grandparents. Um, but it's when okay. they came over, it was sink or swim. And if they if they they came over because they wanted this culture, which is very materialist culture, it's the melting pot culture, whatever. They came over for that. Now we have we have refugees and wars and we have laws and all this kind of stuff. We manipulate immigration now, but before we didn't. So everybody here was here voluntarily. But right. back in their old countries, there were nationalities and that had a very strong impact and this is why marxism gave way to cultural marxism because marxism was about the workers of the world unite and it did not work they had to so they switched it to cultural marxism because identity seemed to be more powerful but it wasn't a problem because it was consistent with national borders and i will quote i think it was macarthur who said one thing's for sure, any country that I ever went into that didn't share a common religion was not going to survive. The culture was, even if it was rising materially, it was declining from a civilization point of view. And this idea of tribalism is introduced into this country by, I, and I don't point to George Soros for much because I think he's just a figurehead. 
But his mentor, the person whose ideas he is implementing is Karl Popper, who, who had this open society idea. And he said, tribalism is our enemy. So what are they doing? They're, they're, they're using tribalism as an excuse to institute world government. And, and in order to do that, they have to get us to identify as tribes. They brought identity politics to the right, and it took them a long time to do it. And that's where you're seeing this thing. But I think it's it was planted intentionally. You know, well, well, and then we go back and they say those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. You know, the the Trojan horse is a real thing. Anytime you can get anytime you can get spies into the camp and have them that, that look like the spy, that look like the the culture, that act like the culture, that say the right things, they can pass, they can pass, they can pass. Next thing you know, they start opening the doors from the inside, and that's when the water comes in. It's And there's four analogies in there, and I don't know if any of them make yeah, sense. Yeah, yeah, I got it, I got it. <laughs> yeah, that's what they're doing, and we, we buy it. But this country isn't like that. We really weren't like that. And that's why it took so it just wasn't taking and why do we even have ideological dispute in this country it's clear what our it, like i have a friend from sweden and before they really made this artificial immigration over there to cause all sorts of societal disruption and she was telling me they're basically all the same class and there's kind of she didn't even understand what a party was so she didn't understand but like political parties they all had the same there's like six to eight, 10 million of them. That's not that's that it. many. That's what that's I'm like saying. That's like Rhode Island. Yeah. yeah. So I'm saying you, if you have it, it's fine. So there's this tribe. They're all on the same page. It's fine. Why is this country? Why? What gives the other people the right to say our constitution, our agreement that we all before all immigration laws and everything, but we had voluntarily signed up for who's to say that that's invalid. And now we need a fundamental restructuring of the legal architecture to quote Michael Chertoff. A guy from the right. So, so I want to say it. So I want to make sure I understand this because it seems to me like, first of all, if you have, and we have some good conversation going over on the side, do you want me to bring those questions up, those comments up? No, that's finished. That's okay. Well, my, my question is, and I, I hope I can remember it. When you have a, a population that's small and they all kind of look the same, they have the same culture values, they raise kind of the same. It's easy to point from that, from the outside in and go, look how they're doing it. They're doing it right. But when our culture is a culture of hundreds of different cultures with, you know, from wide range of poverty levels to money and some people, I just think it's hard when you say to everybody, you go figure it out yourselves. The, and I'm not and here's the thing. Yeah. I'm not for big government. I just yeah. know that in a neighborhood, if you don't watch, if, if my, here's the deal in my neighborhood, if I only watch out for my house, then I'm not being a good neighbor. And right. I I yeah. just think there's got to be a role of government to hold us loosely together so we can bounce around inside this thing hey, called the United States. I, yeah, I'm totally fine. I accept. I would Damn consent it. to the Constitution. <laughs> I would accept to the Constitution. The Constitution is the compromise. I'm accepting it. I don't believe that that's I, – I, it's too coercive for my morality, but I accept it. I would, I would accept that compromise. I would sign that contract. But they are not abiding by that contract. I agree. Now, yeah, I, I would say that this idea that we have all these different cultures, whatever, if you take away all the completely wrong laws that came along on immigration and foreign interference and interfering with other countries, all this stuff is a manipulation to get people here who <laughs> did not choose our culture. Our culture is materialist, consumerist, production-based culture. Anybody who emigrated here knew that. But it's Some about, of them but took the money and freedom. went back. Hmm? But a byproduct of that is the freedom. Supposedly. The foundation of it yes. is the freedom. It's economic freedom. It's economic freedom. But that, I, I get that. But that also, but inside that big thing of economic freedom comes the ability to go, get up and go work where you want to work, to move with inside states and go, I want a different job to better myself. If I want to buy something better for my kids, I, want, I can. If I want to break the cycle of poverty, yeah. I can. That's something that a lot, of, a lot of countries, a lot of societies around the United States or civilizations don't have. But here's the thing. If we had it, and they came and they realized how hard it was. So a lot of them went back and we were so wildly successful that other countries were going to have to pivot to us. Other countries were going to have to open up if they didn't want to lose all their citizens. But instead, our country got overrun by people who put the same barriers in place, <clears throat> regulatory barriers to entry, all these things in place that kept that freedom 
to act. And once you put that safety net in, the labor safety net, the uh, minimum wage laws and welfare and all that, I agree. then you have people who are attracted not to the sink or swim thing. Of I course, agree. you can't have it. Then it just catches everybody in the bottom. But that's a subversion too. And we blow up these other countries and then we open our door to the refugees who hate us because we blew up their country. Well, they don't want to be here. That's why that's why materialism they, isn't everybody's thing. But that's why they said, you know, we've created a republic as long as you can keep it. And and I do believe though, at some point in time, when I was saying we have all these cultures, I think it's one of the things that attracts people to America is I can be kind of who I am over there, but we have forgotten the main thing, I think, and that is to sift through our individual culture, keep it, but also find the common ground, the common things that we can yes, have in place. But that's automatic. Because we are a material. But it's not it, Let me now. tell you, it is. Because if you don't have that safety net and you need to go out there and make a living, you're going to take a shower. You're going to wear the clothes. You're going to learn the language. You're going to learn the money. You're going to oh, be I nice see. to yeah, people. Yeah. So yeah. everything we need to agree on, we will. And everything that we want from each other, a great Afghan restaurant for cheap. That's what you're saying. They yeah. And that's the way it was. Yes. That's the way it was. And that's when Rockefeller and everything came in and said, we're never going to get a world government. Well, the United States and all their freedom and all that balance of wealth, all the level playing field and all that makes them this shining city on a hill. We need to push it down. They literally said this, push it down and raise the East up so that when we put them together, the engine doesn't stall. And that's what's happening right now. We're passing the baton to China, not because they're so great, but because we're getting pushed down. Just like MacArthur said, you got to destroy the economy of the United States. That is that that is where your defense should lie. Look, for, I'm learning this as I get older, and I, I didn't know it when I was in 20s and 30s. I didn't I didn't appreciate it. Freedom is hard. Freedom comes with a lot of hard decisions, I think. I think freedom comes with a lot of sacrifice. I don't think it's the easiest thing in the world or it would have been done right a long, long time ago. And But I will tell, tell you this, you. of, of yeah. everybody around right now, I'll take our system over everybody else's. I, I, I have to re-examine this day, but generally speaking, I have was raised to agree with you and I did. But when I was 13 years old, I remember thinking, Freedom is a burden. I don't know what to do. I'm worried. I used to worry about the future. Freedom yeah. is a burden. And a lot of people succumb to that because they don't have the prospects I had. I was absolutely poor, dirt poor, but boy, could I kill a standardized test. So I knew I could, I had what was necessary in this thing. And all I had to do was be identified and there was a mechanism for that. So I wasn't as worried, but I was still worried. Imagine if I was one rung lower than that and I was like, wow, every you know, hundred million people are gonna be in competition for the same thing. I, I, I might even try something I can't achieve. I'll spend my whole life trying something and I'll fail at it because maybe there's just too much competition. <sighs> Freedom is a burden and I think that's why people don't want it. But I think it's let's see. I think people do want it. We've just been we've been convinced the last fifty years, uh, and you know we're having this conversation on the the anniversary of D Day. I think we have forgotten. And I, again, before we go back and start unraveling that thread of why we were in you know World War II, <clears throat> I just think people have forgotten. Just like with freedom comes responsibility. That I mean, with uh, uh, comes your choices come with responsibility. Freedom is heavy, and it's. I think we are kind of spoiled. I think we're reaping the whirlwind of wanting an easier life. You know, what is it they say? If you do the things that are hard and life will be easier, do the things that are easy and life will be hard. That comes about personal discipline. I think we have given up trying to make everybody so happy all the time that we've just kind of put our hands in the air and gone, we don't want to piss anybody off. Let's make everybody happy and okay. We'll, we'll bring the, the high down to the low, the low up a little bit. And now we're all kind of in the middle. I think I'm, I go, I've been going a little deeper lately on this kind of stuff in that I, I believe that what, that the dumbing down of America, this consumer society, all this has made us comfort addicts, mm -hmm. comfort addicts. So we're, we're addicts of, of comfort and consumption. We're really not, I mean, maybe, maybe a different strata of society is, is a leisure, maybe the drug 
users, plenty of those in my family, do seem to be into the kind Shout of- Shout out to your family. Don't stuff. <laughs> don't do stuff. Yeah. I'm a worker, right? So I'm a, I'm a worker. Yeah. And But it feels like to me, as I explore the ideas of permaculture and be, having food independence and that kind of thing, that- it's not so much that it's banned, although I'm sure it's heading in that direction. When when you're not allowed to collect rainwater on your own land, which happens in some places, clearly food independence is not something that we can count on. If you read the UN Habitat One, they want individuals not to be able to own land. So that is under attack. But even without it being uh, illegal, and this is where it's it's really not within my libertarian framework, but it's a, it's a reality nonetheless, which is that you, you kind of don't know what you don't know until you've got $100,000 worth of school loans. So on the day before you started school, you think the world's your oyster. I could be a, a doctor or a lawyer. I could be a secretary or whatever. And then $100,000 later, you think, I could have spent that $100,000 buying an acre of land and planting some trees that I could eat off of forever. And that in this day and age, when you see a wacky stock market, everybody loses their job overnight, food shortages around the corner, you realize you had lots of freedom to choose what uniform you were going to wear. But you didn't really have the freedom to be a multidimensional human being, which is the enemy of the state. Now, this uh, Libertarianism, I think it focuses more on the laws, but I'm talking about a psychological trap. Well, yeah. That and the elite needs to be in control of the but, masses. But now, now we don't even want people to pay the money to go to college. We want college to be free. So there's no rub or you know, there's no sacrifice on anybody's end. And the other myth I think we've been told is that everybody should go to college. Yeah, and I, I think there's some stuff in education that is just so wrong. Again, I think a lot of it goes back to the national side of it. All right, I've got to say this before we move on. I just got to say because I want to go some of some of these quotes. And sure, stuff. take it but, away. But before you. we do that, mm -hmm. so far, mm -hmm. I think this has been pretty fun today. Totally, I can't believe it because last night was that party, and I'm not going to lie to you, I had a cocktail or you two. <laughs> I can tell you that we don't. Who, can we please? <laughs> can we please? <laughs> Please. I'm not getting invited back. All right. So, so normally I only have two cups of coffee, but for you, I'm drinking a half gallon of tea. And I guess it's, it's going straight to my tea. head. Another uh, <laughs> another liquid going straight to my head. Hey, let's do this. Uh let's let's run through some of these comments real quick and then I want to hit some other topics real fast. Cause I know it's you've uh but you're at home today. You're not at your office. I know I am you at home because there's just too much going on. Yes, yes, exactly. Uh okay, so we we've already we got that one. So let me just go through because uh, I hate what I hate to do is have people comment and us not acknowledge them because it oh, takes I a totally long time. Oh, I totally want you, but I so, thought we had a good thing going. Yeah, no, yeah we yeah. did, and it was time to move on because you know this show goes to different places. So this yes. is what John Jasper said, and him and John Ballinger were having a conversation about who's in charge of the <laughs> government, and it says, "But John, who do you put in charge?" And the, and, and here's the thing: yes, and those are all some bad options, but. There's also good options out there. And I think the I think our system, in my opinion, that's why we had the system in place, because these are examples of what can happen if you don't have a system like a republic in place. That's what that's at least why I would say. Yeah, the the problem is that like like the this idea of defund the police, I'm an anarcho capitalist defund the police. But let's make sure we have completely restored oh. the Second Amendment. No, I'm serious. I don't need the police. You, the police don't stop crimes. They do not. So if we had, if we, you need some warning. The Wild These West? Things, you can't do it backwards. The Wild West was not that wild. I would posit that the Wild West was more secure than inner city Baltimore. So I'm just saying, you can't do it backwards. You can't say, okay, we took everybody's guns and now we're going to tell the world that we are no longer defending those people who paid us to defend them. First, you got to say, oh, well, this didn't work. So give me some warning, get that second amendment going again. Because who's going to, what difference, defund the police, who's going to suffer? Well, so the you people who next need it. Right. That's what I'm saying. You went to my next topic. That's if you defund the police, the people that live in the really, really, really rich yes. areas, they're going to be fine. Yeah. It's the same thing with education and healthcare. When you make, 
when you make the third world America a third world country, that's the masses who anytime they want anything from a pay raise to more food, they just have to protest. They can't just vote with their feet and get a job and take a job and make work. They have to protest because everything's in control. They are they are going to get public health care, public education, public security. And with public security comes a lot of rules. You got to go in at 10 o'clock, right? But that's so the way it's always that's when you get a curfew. No, 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 no. If they're going to do it like this, they're if they it's like the healthcare. Once they give you public health care, Bloomberg said it himself. I predicted he would say it, but he said, I'm banning sugary drinks in New York. I, yeah, right. And he said, because I'm now paying for your health care. Same thing with the public with policing. If you say they have total control over it. They're going to tell you nobody's allowed out after 10 because we've got, we don't have any money or well, they're going to send in the federales. Get but we've said that. this about education. As soon as you take the money from the state or from the federal government, they get to control what you teach the kids. And that's what Pelosi has on that's, store for the police. But that's what we've been doing for 50 years now. We've been taking the money. Yeah, so defund them, the but curriculum. give it back to me and let me buy my guns <laughs> with it. Let me organize to let me organize with my with my neighbors. Let me have let me have the curfew. Let How me about, have my let wall. You have the let school me and have, neighbors. Let me have a completely private community by whatever terms I want. But here's the here's the issue you have, I think. And this is why I, 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 I'm so on, on your side on most of this, but I'm trying to figure out how to work this, right? Because if I have 100,000 people in your community that all get together and they say, okay, we kind of agree. And then I have 50,000 people over here in this community and they're teaching different things, different standards. They have different rules because they've agreed. How do we get those two communities to then come together and work together? Why, why do you have to get them to? Well, okay, but uh, no, I'm serious. Like you're, you're in the United just States. Talking about trade. Are we not united? Are we not That's united? That's what the United States is about. It's just about having no trade barriers between states, right? That's okay. all. Just don't erect the trade barriers. But the Amish don't trade with you. Do you care? No, but my question is, uh, let's go back to the education. Okay, point. sorry. If yeah. Tennessee, no, if Tennessee's teaching something completely different than Arkansas or California, oh, John do you Bollinger doesn't think you're doing a good enough job. Oh, I know. He never. He's smarter than I am, though. It's good. Go ahead. All right. Keep uh, going. Thanks for that. Oh, so yeah, but my question is: if you've got a, people in California and people in Tennessee, and they both have completely sta different standards for education yes. as far as what they're mm -hmm. teaching, great. Then, that's what well, it's all about. Okay, that's what it's for. That's what the fifty states are for. Okay. It's best practices or regional preferences, or you get to vote, you get to choose it. That's fantastic. And so then, if the that's Tennessee exactly guy wants want. to, if that's the Tennessee guy wants to move, then he's going to have to up his game or lower his game depending on where he's. I going. don't know whose gun whose gun laws do you want. Uh, I, now that part, I well, yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I'm just asking. That's what it's for. That's why they have to say well, state, they're yeah. convincing you that they have to interact across borders because that's why they they they'll always have a mass shooting well, that that has somebody from a, a low gun law state go over somewhere else and they're like, see, your laws affect us. Your what pandemic year? affects us. What year would you go back and freeze? everything and and ha and circle it and say this point forward everything stays legally and constitutionally bound at this point probably the garden of eden <laughs> and i mean that not even in a biblical sense like i mean i actually am starting to think that the agricultural revolution is when it all went wrong because once you have that kind of surplus you're going to have the political means that captures the wealth and needs to hold you hostage. And they'll do it because you're not smart enough or evil enough to get ahead of them. Read that one. Yeah, I see that. Oh, my Clint, yeah. you need to be. So he thinks he's smarter than I am, but you're not, right? Right. Exactly. No, I think he's as smart. He thinks he's as smart as you, and I'm really dumb, but that's okay, though. You know, and I, I'm just kidding. John's a buddy. But I'll tell you what. He doesn't think that. He's John, a good dude. No, it's all right. But it wouldn't really help. If Clint brings up these, if if you're a real student of this stuff, we would just be talking to each other. But yeah. what what we're doing is we're talking to a broader audience from both of our and John well, because gets that. we John, have to bring it to a. Yeah. I know I'm just John's been on my a podcast a couple of times for different yeah. things because he's super smart. But but here's why I think it's good. Some of the times when I ask you questions, I already know the answer, or I may even yeah. agree with you. But yeah. A lot of times you're trying I think, to tease out the argument, which is what I want you to do. What I think is the right. right. I think it's helpful. Well, here's the other. OK, so it's a favor to me. That is for sure. John, I'll give you a nod to that. It's a favor to me because that I think that means they steal cacostocracy. It's a favor to me because 
you're helping me illuminate my side of the argument. Yeah, yeah. I'm happy to have John illuminate your side of the argument. Well, and my, my issues, I can, I hate to say this. I just had a 45 minute conversation with Eric Buchanan. And if I really wanted to go down these rabbit holes and have mm -hmm. conversations about each topic, we probably could. That's not the well, purpose of this Well, I'm not sure I'm podcast. that interested in that. Yeah, because I, I'm, I'm happy to lay out what I consider to be the valid ideology and my understanding of how the laws work, but <clears throat> I'm happy to have Sweden do whatever they want. And for me, I honestly mean it when I say, I think the agricultural revolution is about, uh, is that we may be that, you know, when you think about that, the lilies of the field or the garden of Eden, isn't it true? We are the only ones who can't just live in nature. Why? We're the smartest. We're the coolest. We've got thumbs. Why it's, can't we live in nature? Well, it, and I, I think the reason these conversations are important is because I think it's good to have you because you bring it. <laughs> you bring up. Some, uh, he'll be all right. Hey, I'll talk to him here in just a minute. But y there's these touchstones that you bring up. But I think I represent a lot of people when we say we understand that we have veered from the path of the intention. Right. The intentional path we were started on, we have veered from that. Our government's gotten too big. Our but, but intention, lot, but not right. the government necessarily. Well, they might have first, always, Lysander Spooner, they might have always meant it. Maybe. To be a trap. maybe. Yes. Okay. Yeah. But I, I think yes. we, though, go, go, we, go. the people, are struggling yes. on how to figure yes. out how to how to navigate the world we're in. I don't live in 1776. I don't live in 1800. And I don't live in 2050. I live in now. And if I take these principles that we were built on and I keep saying, okay, we got to make decisions based off this. Well, the, the problem I have is what I'm looking at. I don't see a representatives that hold a lot of those truths to be self-evident. So I, think I go, idea, what do I do? I think what I do, and I have it has never, ever, ever failed me. I look back. I look at the problem. And I look if there was a, a mandated action that created the problem. Was there a policy? Was it a government thing that you were forced to do it? You can go, I think the government education, I think you go back 100 years and watch them form a historical society, an economics society, public education. I, I think when you go back to that is when you begin to lose the ability for people to think for themselves. And that kind of tension from decentralization, which we were founded on, kept people with their feet on the ground. Patrick Henry said, if, they, if, you, if these people aren't farmers, this isn't going to work. You need to grow your food, understand things. And that probably would have happened if it weren't for, for certain political actions. And John Jasper, I've said this before in other podcasts. I think all systems have, uh, not all systems, I think most systems have decent intentions, right? When they start off, the problem with human nature, you can't legal, you can't legislate human, <clears throat> human nature. But once power is in hands of people, human nature comes in and goes, well, if I can have this, maybe yeah. I can have more and I don't want to lose it. So you start putting things in place that so is we don't want to lose it. That's the thing is that I feel that there is human nature of the people who will who will claim the power and and maximize the power they can get out of whatever system. And then there's a lot of then the people who allow it, the masses are either not not seeing it right, not they're being fooled by it or they're too afraid to keep a hold of their liberty so that they let it go and they and i mean i've been telling people for years that you can't you can't destabilize society by having bad laws like drug laws or the war on terror overseas other countries won't respect you you'll make that problem worse they'll come here they'll make it worse the drug law people don't people don't like it when you go and grab their freaking drugs out of their hands. It's not right. And they're not going to respect you or your system when you go to jail for that. And John Corzine, who stole like a billion dollars or whatever, is laughing. Uh, we're they gonna, just made him give it back. We're going to do We're gonna do what we promise every week. We're 44 minutes into this. I haven't gotten to your tweet yet, dadgummit. Uh, John Ballinger would enjoy a discussion about where yeah. things went south and who allowed it. My opinion is the citizens who are the majority have been complicit in the allowing to fail, uh, allowing the failure to take more of a rapid descent. I agree. Totally. And I that's agree. why I kind of think that, I mean, if I were to have, I, I, I almost wonder if a monarchy is a better scenario no. than a democracy because no. a monarch can get his head cut off. Yeah. And the democracy, as long as you have the power, be, 
propagandized. As long as you have the power. I mean, I've seen quests for the it's Holy Grail. It's so much Grail. easier for, for I've seen quests for the, for the Holy Grail. It's the funny stuff. It's funny, you know, when you get into the uh, you know those stuff. Uh, is there anything? Is a is so? Is there an is, age limit for anything? So uh, the question, I guess, is can you get the government to use force on a child to prevent that child from doing something he or she wants? I mean, I think we have the system in place. I think parents are taking care of that. I think you have to recognize human nature. The family is actually undermined by the state and yes. child services. I've heard more stories of child services hurting people. Look at the case of Nancy Schaefer and her, her husband <laughs> who are alleged murder suicide in, at, in Georgia. She was a state Senator who exposed the pedophilia and stuff in the child, in the child services. So I think that uh, the family structure is fine. I, okay, I agree with that up until the point of I think there's things that have been intentionally put in place over the last 60 years to tear the family structure completely Absolutely, apart. that's what I'm saying. So yeah. the problems you have are probably a result of bad policy. So but that's a great, okay. But, but that's your a, community too works. So what you were talking about before, Clint, what you've said more than once, and I agree with it, you have a community of like-minded people. That's what we do. And some guys, like that guy is abusing his kids. Your little mob of other dads are going to take care yeah. of that. But here, that's this is kind of a, a good uh, Probably. explanation. More, of what I, more likely than what's happening when than the state. Of what I was asking. So let's talk about the if, if things have been put in place to pull the family structure apart. And now you have these leftover individual family members. You have single moms. You have children. You mm -hmm. have dads that are over here now doing mm -hmm. their own thing. Getting you know, paid to not marry the mom. Okay. But now you've got this burden on society. And this is exactly what I'm talking about. So I'm a 30 year old living right now in 2020. These things have been put in place for 60 years. I'm mm -hmm. reaping the whirlwind. How am I supposed to look at a kid or a single mom going, I need to figure out how to navigate the consequences of what's going on. How am I supposed, I can't just stand up and go, well, technically this is just wrong. Cause it's not how we started. It's not our true intent. Cause they're going to look at me and go, we still need to eat. We still need. So, food. what's your question? Do you end welfare? No, I don't know. That's is that what your I question. Guess. Because I'm saying the same thing about defund the police. You can't, you can't put them in a terrible position. Take all their guns away, and then that moment when they're most vulnerable, take away what you bought them off with. So, what are you going to do with the with the welfare thing? That's my First question. First of all, take away all the incentives that keep the parents from getting married. Take away the incentives from people to make it the least amount of money possible and have the most kids possible. Take away the the incredible uh, profit from drugs by having a drug war in the same places that they have state education, government-run education, which weirdly is so much worse than the inner city. Don't the states pay for a lot of that education stuff? Aren't there transfers of wealth? And even when I lived in Texas, they would transfer from the richer place to the small. They would do busing and everything. Why is it? That's the systemic racism you got to worry about, is that they know that keep, read the report from Iron Mountain. They got to keep that hierarchy in place and they have to have despised minorities. That's a quote from a government document. If Rumors are to be believed. I am convinced, though, that when people say you've got to use your vote as a protest, if you look at not all, but if you look at a lot of the places that are in the highest turmoil, that have the worst of this, that have this systemic whatever, insert this group here, it's usually people who have voted on the liberal side. Usually a lot of times the Democrats they don't understand liberal fundamental principles and been, they kid themselves about what they want. They've been what voting they for, want for is free. Years. Yeah. They think that discomfort is is immoral. And they think <clears throat> that right. they have a right to be comfortable. Okay, we got to do we don't have a right to be We got to do what this show was meant to do. I want to keep moving along. What is the show meant to do? Move it along, hit a lot of different oh. things. That's why. That's true, but it's a rigged game. 300 million Americans just want to live their lives and are too busy making ends meet to keep an eye on the ruling class while the ruling class has all day and loads of our money to work. Yes, this is what this is what I call, they don't want us to go, oh, look at the baby. Uh, they don't want us to go all Ron Paul. So this is why I think that you have progressive taxation. Is So when people say, oh, tax the rich, income tax does not tax the rich. Income tax <clears throat> taxes the most well-educated, most productive members of the middle class because the rich do not pay income taxes. They are rich because they have assets. The assets throw off a different kind of income. 
So why do you have a progressive income taxes? You have progressive income taxes so that people can't go Ron Paul. So you can't have a regular person, very highly educated, who still has his feet on the ground, accumulate a few bucks and put them in the bank and go to Washington. If you're waiting until you drop to retire and then the market splits in half and you can't and and you're just scratching it out, you have I agree with John. There's just no way to go. That's why you don't want it to be in DC. That's why you want subsidiarity. You want stuff to be taken care of at the lowest possible level. And if you don't think that what's going on in this country right now is is national in lockstep, that it's just this weird simultaneous uprising of the exact same phenomena from, from government response to illness, all of which was misguided and all of which was totally consistent but with each other. Did you see the headlines where they came out? And then I want to talk about John Ballinger's point where they said that the health experts came out and said, by the way, we are not going to condemn the protest or riots, but you still can't get together and have parties of over like 12 people or 200 people. 1,200 scientists signed a letter saying the COVID riots and protests are fine, but anything else, like if you were protesting when you're protesting, going back to business, then those are yeah. still, uh, they're still saying- Well, look, should. that's part of what their plot is. Their plot, look, they wouldn't even have gotten these protests and riots together if they didn't have a, a, a powder keg waiting to blow with 10 10 weeks of people locked down, regardless of who it is or what. They got people on the streets because they were so pent up. And then, yeah, that, but they're 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 preparing us. Maybe these riots were were protests <clears throat> were put together to usher in the second wave and to blame Maybe. it on those people. Maybe. I just know that when you tell me I can't have a I can't go to my son's graduation, but we can, you know, because that's a big group and you're saying that group's okay. Six feet is six feet, stay at home orders or stay at home orders. Either we have them or we don't. And I'm a guy that lives in a bubble. So if I'm saying that, then yeah. I'm coming from a place of fear. Hey, John Ballinger said the fourth branch of government I'm referring to, he really wants to, I should have, yeah. He's talking to John Jasper, I think. I th well, he made a comment earlier. Yeah, it's about, fine. No, yeah. I mean, I um, we can definitely pick pick up on it. That's the fourth branch of the government I'm referring to, which is the lobbyists and special interest groups. When we allowed our elected officials to be bought off legally, it's been downhill since. When we started yeah. allowing lobbyists. Anything on that one? Uh, so you're I mean, behind allow. that. Even. You're even behind that. You think there's more behind that even. Yeah. I mean, allow lobbyists. I, uh, why are they, why is, what, where is the power coming from though? I, I still think that if you restore the 10th amendment, there isn't very much that the lobbyists can buy. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I don't, is that, I, and Citizens United, like our corporations, people, our foundations, people, if they're people, there should be a rule against perpetuities, which I would be in favor of. I just. <laughs> Did you see the uh, CNN? Did you see Como? Uh, is it Como or Como? Como, Como. Andrew Cuomo. Cuomo. No, no, no. The CNN guy's brother. Chris, uh, Cuomo? Chris Cuomo. Yeah. Did you see when he talked about the other day, he did his little editorial where he said the, uh, where does it say riots and protests have to be peaceful or, or polite? And then a guy read it to him. It says peaceably assemble. It's written. You have the right to oh, peaceful. Oh, that's so funny. Yes, <laughs> yeah. yes, and It yes. says it right here. I don't know if this little document. It says. But we don't peaceful. actually. We don't have the right to peacefully assemble right now. That government We stopper. don't. I kept saying, I want to restore the First Amendment. They should not. You know, this is the first thing I said to you. A first show I know, probably. I know, I know. That the legislation marches on, but they, but our right, First Amendment right to to protest legislation. Oh, they keep passing the bills. They keep, they keep I know. checking out. And then she's going to do this police bill without our right. You've already to... talked about defunding police. I'm going through the stuff I wanted to talk about today. Go for it. All right. Are you feeling okay? Do you still have some more time? Cause this one's fun. Yeah. I have or, some time. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, John. So this is his follow up to that comment. Let me hide it and pull this one up. The lobbyist budget is three and a half times the Congress, Senate and executive branch. Some people say, so I've heard economists combined, combined. suggest that that's because the government is underfunded and that the lobbyists are doing all the studies. But uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I always feel like term limits, lobby control, if you want to introduce these new fixes, I still will always go back and look at the possibility that the problems were created by not adhering to the constitution. I mean, I really think that if you restore the 10th amendment, you aren't going to have 
the any opportunity like the, the reason i prefer the articles of confederation is that they do not uh, allow for the government to collect taxes so the reason our government's a problem is because it has the right the right take our it money. asserts the right to collect taxes uh john jasper in response that's because political power does not come cheap don't confuse a horse and cart God, we got some, you got some smart people out here. Uh, well, it's your guy and my guy, the two Johns. Uh, Eric is so John frustrated. Guy. He texted me at 2.30, goes, I'm teeing off in five minutes. I'm really frustrated. I'll be back next <laughs> week. Hey, uh, well, so, we, can, we, we can't work around him because we tell people to meet us here at this no, time. No, no, we're not working around Eric. I love Eric. He can come back anytime he wants. Hey, uh, let's do this. Let, I want to go through some of the tweet screenshots sure. that I sent you, if you're okay with that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, and that way we can kind of, you can tell everybody what you meant. And before I do that, as I'm pulling them up, tell everybody where to find you on Twitter. So if they want to follow you. I sure will. My Twitter handle is at Monica Perez show. And I basically tweet around the clock. <laughs> I'm thinking of taking Sundays all off the time. All, all the time because I do most of my tweeting after everybody else in my house is asleep. This is why drinking coffee and tea all day is but probably a she mistake told me, for me, but benefit for Twitter. You told me when we started this, she goes, listen, here's what we can do. Uh, you can send me some questions. I'll send you some questions, but just go to my Twitter and pick out a few. But I'm like, but you have 24 Twitter tweets a day. I don't understand how, if I do seven days of that, I have 330 yeah. tweets. Just just anything that has my face next to it that I didn't retweet from somebody else is the stuff that's my original thought. So uh, that's the stuff that is, makes sense to talk to me about. Last comment, and then we're going to do the tweets. Uh, not confused at all. Citizens fund big corporations who sell their companies on Wall Street and citizens this fund is it so through important. our retirement account. Here's the thing is that this whole labor versus capital Marxist thing is a, an absolute non-starter in this country because anyone with a dime can buy a share of stock. So when they talk about stakeholder interests or get corporations to make political statements, then all of a sudden you cannot participate in capitalism, being the side of capital as a person of labor, without supporting a political agenda that you don't agree with. And these CEOs, they don't own the companies. They're not the guys who are letting you invest in the company they built from the ground. They're a lot of times just politicians. So you see Target take a stand on transgender bathrooms in a community that would not like that. So they're not doing it for their customers. They're doing it for the politics of it. And then you see them say, oh, we got to close down because of riots. And my guess is they're going to step up for bailouts. Yes, they and they're going to get them because they're playing the role they're meant to play. But it's well, it's another way to co-opt your money. Like instead of taxes, is having these corporations take your your participation in capitalism and make it political. We're so. heading for another quasi shutdown. I think anyway. I think they're wanting to do that again. COVID thing. Months. Yeah, I think they're wanting. Yeah, to W, do not a V. They showed the V. <clears throat> the um. The little, Stock market's uh, a V, yeah. but it's probably going to be a W. W. Well, maybe it'll be just you know a mountain horizon from now on. Maybe that's what we got in store for us. <sighs> All right, you it? you said this, uh, Monica Perez, on your Twitter account. In my opinion, the real Third Amendment issue right now mm -hmm. is using my home to house arrest me. I have been laughing, or not laughing, but I just laughingly said once years and years ago, just like I said. Once they're, they haven't yet tapped into the age dialectic. They haven't yet pitted young people against old people. It was just an unexploited dialectic. And right after that, Parkland happened, which had people like Greta or Hogg come out and be the saviors of the world. You guys suck, blah, blah, blah. So that was an unexploited dialectic. The Third Amendment was an un, unviolated uh, amendment pretty much. And so I said, when is the Third Amendment going to be a, under attack. And they talk about it in DC, like the guards staying in the hotels is a third amendment violation. I, I imagine they're getting paid for it. They do get paid. The hotels will get paid for it. I'm sure they're Who's going to pay for it. I assume the, the governments that are paying for the national guard, whoever yeah. paid for the bullets is paying it's, for the bet. I think it's us, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I don't know if it was the Utah national guard. I think but whoever, Utah. if it's coming from a government, a government checkbook. Yes, then it's we, definitely yeah. us and we're doing it. And that is what the third amendment requires. But I am being forced in here. I had to buy another <clears throat> printer. I have to, I had to, you know what I mean? I, I'm forced to stay in my house. I'm under house arrest. I cannot use uh, outside facilities that I was accustomed to using 
and they are forcing me to occupy my own home basically through threat of force. So they might as well be standing at my door with a gun because if I tried to violate it, I'm saying in the in a stylized yeah. example, right. if I tried to violate it, they would be on my doorstep with a gun. They well, would have to up, occupy my home. Yeah, they broke up parties and stuff and told everybody to go yeah. back home across the country. You know, I've got a – maybe John can help or you know, CPA, and I'm sure it's a real simple question. But do you realize – I started thinking about this. A lot of companies, especially here in Chattanooga, there's one big company that's saying they're going to start doing the work from home thing like on a permanent basis moving forward for a, a section of their folks. That's going to affect a lot of stuff when it comes to taxes because if all of a sudden <clears throat> you work the front desk – and we can have phone systems come to you. Like, for instance, the place I work at has 15 or 20 people. Well, if they can call this number and they can do their job because electronic files from their home, now all of a sudden I've got to write off a bunch of stuff for my house. Is that going to – I just think there's a lot of unknowns about what's going to happen when you tell millions of people to work from your home forever. Well, I we unknow it, but they know it. I think they know it and they're absolutely happy. They, 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 they. The World Economic Forum, Bill and Melinda Gates, Johns Hopkins, George Soros, probably Rupert Murdoch, everybody who's going <clears throat> along with it, everybody who covers up the real truth of these stories, everybody who hides evidence and doesn't call out the bullshit data, everybody is the they. And they are happy to, they don't care if people die. It's just, just, just like calling a war. Well, some innocent people are going to have to die. We're oh, going to have to draft some soldiers. We're going to have to kill some innocent civilians that because it's for the greater good, blah, blah, blah. That's how they think. They think of the people as chattel. Maybe if we bow to Bill and Melinda, they'll forgive us the second shutdown. I doubt it. Oh, I think they'll only forgive it if they cannot get away with it. And I think they're ginning up good reasons. Maybe the lockdown protests weren't taking off enough. They were trying to blame it on the lockdown protests, but it just the, the people the lockdown protests were were respecting social distancing. It just wasn't working. Yeah, they were and they weren't they weren't being violent about it. Um so you posted this and I don't know if you can answer it because it looks like there was an article attached. How to identify visible and invisible surveillance at oh, protests. Yes. Yes, um, I did write that down. Uh, sorry, I had to make a note. Of an, I thought that was an interesting thing that the lockdown protests weren't working. I had just thought of that. Yeah, I, I jotted down what are visible and invisible ways that they're using surveillance. This was an article from the Activist Post. They, there, you can see. So a, a lot of what they do is they take the facial recognition, the cop body cams. I predicted this the day they moved for cop, bo, bo, cop body cams years ago. They are going to use them at protests to identify which side you're on. And this, this, so you can look at cop body cams. You can see there's usually a lens. Drones, you can see them. You can see license plate readers on poles or on cop cars, red light cameras, of course, you can see those mobile surveillance towers. I never realized what one of those was. It's just like a little thing with a, a big antenna and yeah. some little cells on top. I never knew what that was. Forward looking infrared cameras, I guess, are used at night. I don't even know what that is. Then the ones that they are more obvious about, facial recognition cameras, if a cop wants to take your picture, I think that's happening there now. Social media monitoring, uh, you don't see that. Cell site simulators. So it looks like a cell tower, but it's actually a, a honey trap to get your phone to, to think that it's a cell tower. And you know, when you walk by a cell tower, your phone tells it it's there. It pings, yeah. Yeah, and then this is, your phone is telling something else that it's there. And that's how they're uh, identifying if you're on protest or not. Or other things. So then there's also a real-time crime center that takes all of the surveillance data and it and it accumulates it in, I think fusion centers are like this. They fuse all the data, they put it in your name, it's not anonymized, and they can also run predictive algorithms. So what they think is going to happen pre-crime, they think you're going to be The minority that. report. Exactly. It's coming. 100%. It's yeah, that's work. called predictive programming. Yeah. They tell you what's coming so that you're ready you know that you're that you don't you're not shocked by the we can put monica analysis. on a we can put monica on a watch list because we can predict her behavior oh monica is on a watch list That's absolutely hey uh okay so i've got a couple more tweets i want to mm -hmm. make sure I, I have i'm okay with time are you okay with time 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, cause this is, this is fun. So John Ballinger said, uh, when I asked about, you know, when you, what happens when you send millions of people to work from home, he said, it's going to make it worse for people because we already suck at interpersonal skills. And that's why we picked back. Oh, leaders. that's such a good point. <clears throat> Especially teenagers. Oh my gosh. It was already so bad. You know, I said this uh, to my buddy when I talked, I said, you know, my Eric is a, a, a very well respected with tons of success attorney. He is used to this back and forth. He's used to being criticized, critical thinking, not taking it personal. So when he posts uh, something on social yeah. media, he can handle it. He's got filters. Mm-hmm, He's mm-hmm, got some mm-hmm. Teflon. You put a 14 year old old out there who may think a little different. Oh my they, gosh. They just yes. shut up and they say whatever society tells them to say. We have a whole generation that's been trained to go, whatever makes it to where I don't get in trouble. And that's what's going to happen to them. Uh, let's see. Collateral damage. We have somebody new, Nicole. Uh, when you were talking about uh, people get hurt in war and what happens, you know. Uh, we have to recruit more soldiers and people are going to get hurt. Yes, collateral, collateral damage. damage. Yes. And they said, I, I was watching a conversation with history with Harvey Chrysler, I think from Berkeley, who does these things. There, there are a lot of them. They're good. They're, they're an insight. And so they, everybody on there is a they. And he, and they talked about how the less collateral damage, the less obvious, the less soldiers you have to kill, the more you can continue these conventional wars in other countries and Americans won't object to your spending their tax dollars as long as they don't have to see the blood. Now, John, they includes Putin. That's a question mark. <sighs> no. Just no, admit you don't it. Think so? No. I, I you don't think, think Putin I he think, doesn't out ISIS. No, but I think, I think he's but like, I think they I, is every country that has a vested interest in the United States not doing as well as we've been doing. I think John Jasper is talking about when I say they, I mean the controlling overlords. I mean the World Economic Forum. I mean Bill and Melinda Gates. I mean yeah. Johns Hopkins. All of those. And is Putin one of those people? I would say it's more like this, that it, I was just looking at an Albert J. Knock quote, trying to find it. I could not find it. In Our Enemy, the State. But it's basically... The team who's going to benefit from sticking to the Constitution is the one that's going to thump it. And it flips around. So people used to thump the crap out of it when Obama was in office. And now not so much. Now it's all about, oh, don't be so strict. You know, ha, ha, ha. So Putin, I think, similarly knows that an even playing field, following the rules, put your money where your mouth is when it comes to democracy and competition and all that is in his favor. And that's why I think they go along with it. And I think he also thinks it's in his favor to <clears throat> s- to support things that are not what you see is what you get, like ISIS and Snowden. He doesn't out that stuff. No. COVID, he's not outing it. John Ballinger said predictive modeling. Not predictive yeah, programming. Yeah. yeah. In addition, I think it probably yeah. means in addition. Well, they do that in insurance all the time, right? They take your they take your assessment. They go, are you a smoker? Are you a drinker? Mm. How are you? And you're gonna we're gonna charge you more money if you do these things because we can predict that you're gonna cost the system more. Oh my gosh, yes, and I love that because insurance the government, in my opinion, is largely a terrible insurance plan. You're forced to pay it. You're forced to pay the cops to protect your stuff. And if they don't protect it, they don't pay you back. They don't buy you a new one. But an insurance company would. And if you had insurance, they would come guard your house, depending. I'm sure they'd send a guard over if they were if they were defending your diamonds and they were that valuable. But but yeah, but, but then they also get into the, no, but, go ahead. I'm sorry, my bad. Yeah, but but the thing about the insurance, so I needed insurance. I was having kids and we just needed some insurance, some life insurance. My husband insisted on it. And they gave me a blood test, I think it was, and they found nicotine in my system. I told them I quit and I did quit, but I sneaked to smoke. And they they said, we're suspending your life insurance for a year or we're raising your rates by like a million percent. So I had no insurance for a while. And boy, I never smoked a cigarette. And I, and I was absolutely, haven't smoked since, and I really, those rules are rational and they work. And if you want to protect society or protect people from themselves, you can even have a neighborhood insurance pool but and until, your neighbors will watch you. She it, was smoking on the back porch. But until it becomes to the point of, again, you put human beings in charge of this private system and they're going to try to squeeze every profit dollar out of it. And what happens is I start looking at Clint's lifestyle and go, you know, he's driving too fast. We don't need to sell those kind of cars. You know what? We're protecting him. No, back. no. Yeah. Not sell those kind of cars. He, if he wants that. kind. So the, another thing they wouldn't let me do is scuba dive. Right. Or race car drive. Mm-hmm. So I can't. And if you do can't that afford stuff, it, though, right? if you can't afford it, you can't do it. 
then you are that then in my opinion on that is then you're really that's then again we go back to the question what is the freedom do i have the freedom to do what i want or not because then all of a sudden if you're telling me that i've got a group of people whether it's private or government and they're saying clint you know we're going to cover you but we've noticed a little bit you're bringing home wendy's about twice a week <laughs> and yeah. we've been noticing well, this we're not going to protect you anymore your Apple phone has the algorithm for that. But what I was amazed at, I'm a, I'm a CFA, so I've studied all these, like how these financial things work. And what I was amazed at is that insurance is, it makes its profit solely, I think, primarily, John probably knows, or can clarify, from just having money in the bank. I don't think it actually makes money by covering you. It makes money by being financially um, prudent. So when I see the government having what's probably going to be $30 trillion worth of debt for this terrible insurance plan that doesn't even reimburse me when it fails and tries to protect me from itself, it seems to me it doesn't even mean to They sent you $1,200. They sent you $1,200. They didn't send they me didn't $1,200. They didn't bucks. send me 1200 bucks. <laughs> Before we get back to the tweets, uh, John Ballinger said, the McCarran-Ferguson Act of 1945 says the government cannot regulate the industry. The, uh, the industry. But they the only do, industry that has yes. no oversight from Uncle Sam. And they, But the states, and I'm sure he knows this, this is what people say is a big problem with healthcare, but let the states do what they want. They won't let the insurance companies operate across straight, state lines, or maybe that's a way that the insurance companies <clears throat> protect themselves from getting... Uh, from bypassing that act. You are right in the middle of John's sweet spot. I'm sure he'll answer that. Before he does, let's ask another tweet you had, because uh, I'm going to wrap it up in about 10 minutes if we can. Uh, health experts fear a long-term damage to the CDC's credibility. You posted that. Yes. So I thought it was obvious what it meant, but what that article meant, but it was not. I think it's because their data has been ridiculous, that it's been inconsistent. It's not true. If you actually look at their data, if you dig in, you will see that the deaths have not gone up year over year. And, uh, and But what it actually is, it was taking shots at the guy who runs it, Redfield, and saying that he had run-ins in the past when he was an AIDS researcher with Burks and Fauci. So I either think that they are trying to oust him and maybe replace him with Fauci, or, or maybe this guy, Red, Stephen Red, who was in the Event 201, or they're just trying to gin up another personality conflict to keep us distracted from the real issues. Yep. One or the Look other. Over but here I would, while we do yeah, this. I would just say what to watch out for is Redfield is under attack at the CDC. Wonder where they're going to take this. How uh, they're going to use it against us is usually how I think. Disrespect for Americans. Moscow calls out AG bars claims that foreign yes. actors meddled with ongoing protest. So I, they owe and. Susan Rice also said that she, that if AG, AG Barr says that he's got evidence, my guess is he has evidence against Russia because it has their fingerprints all over it. So I think that they're using that because, A, they need to gin up this scare of foreign interference. It's in their plans. Binkley, my co-host, played for me on the Propaganda Report a clip which was shocking from, I believe it was the U.S. Army College, about how they need a tripwire around the 2020 election just to prove how dangerous Russia is, even if they need to set a trap for Russia, a tripwire for Russia. So who knows what they're up to in that regard. But I think a lot of what the bar thing was one of the several purposes is that he wanted to make sure it was clear that when they take action, uh, then the federal government oversteps its bounds by taking action against protesters or rioters. They are not actually attacking protesters. They're not violating the First Amendment. They're not violating the Tenth Amendment, that it's a foreign thing. So it, it will justify its uh, federal intervention. I think he's just setting it up for martial law, which was what one of the things was in that tripwire clip that Binkley pay, played. They were contemplating instituting martial law around the 2020 election. And we've already heard him. You know, we've got other it. Yeah, we, yeah, and and we threaten more. You know, we'll send in the we'll send in the military if you can't get federalize the national federal. guard. So John system. Ballinger responded about the insurance. Buffett calls calls that the float when you were talking about money in the bank. Yes, the yes, yes. Uh, let's see, I'll pull it up. Uh, he is the richest person in the world on insurance. So let me pull that down and pull up. What yeah, the, the float, float is the money made on the premiums prior to paying losses. This money with social media predictive monitors possible cash. Yes. And, and I would just say, why not? Why doesn't the government do that? 
Now, I'm sure John's on my side with that, but I'm just saying that is one of the many ways that you can demonstrate mm -hmm. the lie. And I would also say that of all the all the governments in this country take in prior to this year, seven, eight trillion dollars. And if you took off what would really be legitimate functions of government, I would say, even including public works, which I don't consider legitimate, but even then you you probably have like five trillion dollars left. It's amazing how much of it is really about social security. Um, I would say unnecessary defense spending, kind of like cronyism, uh public education, all that stuff that is effectively a transfer. Mm -hmm. You could give every single person you want United Bay you want uh, the universal basic income, you could give the lower half of the country a $30,000 check each every well, year well, after taxes. That's, that's where how you much go. they're wasting. That's where you go to, you know, the universal income stuff too. Where but that's what, the, this is the thing. They're just going to layer that on top of all this other crap. Yeah, they're not going to So I don't back. want any of that. Trust me. I'm an anarcho-capitalist. I want <laughs> permaculture. Get off of my property. I can do the rest. That's what I want. But I'm just saying... At least I respect Sweden prior to their foreign infiltration, I guess. But I would I respect that they are almost unanimous in in how they have this government that I wouldn't like. But they they are. But we we don't even have a government that's in it that's coherent. And this whole idea that we have this battling ideology that needs to take over the whole country, this is crazy. Is it socialism or is it? Is it freedom? Well, it's not freedom, but I'm just saying it. It's just it's obvious yeah. that nobody wants to resolve the problems because that's where all the money keeps flowing to the top. Conflict creates money flows. You posted to the this. Top. You posted this. Elon Musk calls for the breakup of Amazon. Such a douche. So oh, did you sorry. call? Did you call me that? No, oh, Elon like, Musk. He's I just thought, a created person. He's I thought fake. I was asking I can't stand good him. It is a good question. So, <laughs> so that whole thing was about this the guy who's being propped up as the COVID, the COVID sleuth, the guy that's acceptable to the mainstream who questions the COVID data. Berenson, I think his name is. People sent me, you might've sent me his link when he first came out. Oh, a New York Times reporter or whatever said something bad about COVID data. So now he put out a book and that will be the book, no doubt. And I'm sure it, it's a limited hangout. I'm not sure. I suspect it's a limited hangout that puts out a lot of valid and kind of already out there information and then withholds something important like, but COVID-19 is a terrible illness that we need to be afraid of. So he's going to he's going to correct the record for a lot of stuff and Elon Musk said Amazon needs to be broken up because they suppressed this book by this guy. Amazon came back later and said, "Oh, that was an accident. We we didn't mean to." But that makes that guy's book the definitive book if you're questioning COVID. It gave him a lot of credibility and a lot of publicity and I would say it's Read Virus Mania instead. Virus Mania. But anyway, uh, but I do think Amazon probably will get broken up because it, it will, like Standard Oil, it'll just create even more wealth with the appearance of competition. How about how about social media? Do you think they'll get broken up or, or somehow dampened? Uh, well, it seems like the regulations, the executive order that Trump did and however they're going to deal with it going forward is meant to actually – lock it in as an oligopoly to lock it in so that there are no startups. That whole section 230 was about making it fertile for startups. And now as Barr said, they're not startups, they're Titans. Uh, we can stop. And it's like, well, you're just locking it in for the Titans and then you yeah. regulate it and they're happy to have it regulated because startups cannot afford, afford to compete. Yeah. Yeah. To compete. Uh, John Ballinger, and we'll, we'll wrap it up here in just a second, said the insurance industry is $8 trillion annually of the $22 trillion GDP. You know what's interesting is GDP. that it seems to me that the that the, th the tax code is heavily biased towards the financial industry in this. My yeah. interest on my mortgage is tax deductible, not, not lately because I'm in transition, but the interest on the mortgage was traditionally tax deductible, but rent is not tax deductible. Your health insurance premiums have tax benefits, but your doctor's bills don't. So 
it's the financial industry just has tax deductibility that other things don't. Food isn't tax deductible. I guess you could say that since there's a basic deduction, that's food. Washington players can't help lying. They probably lie about everything so they don't accidentally tell the truth when it matters most. Yeah, my father always said, if you are going to be a liar, you have to have a good memory. That's true. Man, I got to be honest with you, Monica Perez. I, this has probably been one of the fastest episodes we've done. I don't know how I got the energy, man. Maybe I should have more rum sours. Absolutely. I mean, I didn't have one now. I had one yesterday. I, was just, you ha I only saw you drink one. Yeah, and then I had uh, two glasses of wine and a bottle of seltzer. You're telling people now. You got on to me earlier because I was telling how many you drink. I just said you had one, and then you went and told on yourself. I didn't know. You started holding up. I didn't know where that was going to end. <laughs> uh, so, I, but again, I really do love these Saturday conversations. And me too. I really enjoy it. And thanks, guys, for joining. That really made it much more interesting. The well, Johns it looks like the other kids kind of took a back seat to the Johns, but they were next, they were making a very lively conversation, which I absolutely adore. Yeah, we had. And good. then this goes on YouTube. If anybody is only just tuning in, I put it on my YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash Monica Press Show, I think. Fantastic conversation. Thanks, Fran. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and I put it up on my YouTube channel during the break podcast. What's your stuff? Tell me what you want it's, us to listen to. That's just during the break. It's just during the break podcast.com. I have several. I have Dayfire podcast, which is actually growing through the roof. Uh, we have uh, we interviewed a guy yesterday out of California, or it was released yesterday, and he has the uh, record for the fastest ascent of some big mountains. And so he he's one of those guys. He's oh, a, really? He's a sponsored moment uh, athlete, and he uh, he just sees a big peak, a big mountain peak. Yeah, and he runs it. He goes. He goes. Wow! Well, my buddy, my husband and son are going uh, are training for a big hike over the summer. Maybe I'll turn them on to your day fire, fire podcast. Well, the guy I host it with has been in the outdoor industry for forty years, and he knows everybody around the country, and he takes big giant trips. So he would love uh, the podcast, dayfirepodcast.com. And then I have one for single folks called The Single Life. But anyway. I think that sounds like a good one. You've told me some <sighs> of the funny stories on that one. I don't think I'd be allowed to listen to that. If you, if I like you, to keep my husband slightly insecure so that <laughs> he keeps you know the flattery coming. Just beat him down it's and a, build him up. It's all a game. Beat it's him down and build yeah. him up. Yes, the so cult of money. The last one, if you go to DuringTheBreakPodcast.com, me and Coralie released one a couple months ago because we're just not doing them as much. Um, but we reviewed an article from 1958 that was 150-something ways, 120-something ways to get a husband. And it's based off 1958 thinking. Really? It is I totally agree. I was trying to silly, tell my daughter. Oh, it's the it's silly. silly? Oh, it's God. silly? Yes. Things like stand in a corner and cry because men like to comfort you. Yes. Yeah, stuff like that. Hey, man, that stuff might work. I don't know. I was never very good at catching, hanging on, none of that. My husband just, he just decided I was lucky. the one. Thank hey, God. Man, if you're going to go listen to some podcasts. He's good for me. Go to the single life podcast.com, but go to during the break podcast.com. And it's the second one we've, you'll see it at the very top. It's me and Corley. Uh, but I want everybody to check out the prop report and the propaganda report with you. Hey, and thank you. And, and that party is super fun. The disappearing patron party is super duper. And fun. how much? John Jasper's in London. I want to do a brunch one so that he can come. How about you girls? My girls over here, Nicole and Franny and Star, you'll come. How so? How much does it cost? What patron level do I get to come? Oh, to the party? so if you want to come to the first Friday free for all, that's ninety minutes. The first Friday of the month, all you need to do is uh, be a patron of the truth, which is seven dollars a month. But you get not only the thirty dollar daily news, the thirty minute daily news show. You get the four, it's a forty five minute daily news show for you, and then um, so that's for seven dollars. And then if you want more parties, it's a little bit more. Ten bucks for both parties. For twenty, you get a shout out. So if you have a business that you want to promote or a podcast you want to promote, if you're a twenty, I'll give you a monthly shout out, which is like a little ad. I love that. So the <laughs> you're a genius. I'm a win-win. I'm a genius at win-win. What do you get for a dollar? 
<laughs> lots of love, <laughs> lots bro. Of love. Actually, the people who are grandfathered in at a dollar get all that free content. Yeah. I couldn't take it away from them because they were such early supporters. They're doing good. You're doing great and you're growing. You could probably find a one dollar entry that gets you something free if you're clever. You I will tell you this. I'm I will say this and I'll let you go because you've given me a lot of your time and I have nobody expecting anything from me. You do. And I will say mm. this though. You I've watched since the show got canceled in Atlanta and I've watched your podcast yes. grow and your social media grow and it couldn't happen to a nicer group of folks like you and Aww, Victor, So Thank you. Yeah, it's so much better. I feel like that was holding me back. Now you can shine. <laughs> All right. Hey, tell your husband thank you for letting me go about 25 yes, minutes. Yes, he's over. a good man. Thank right. you. Bye, everybody.